Thank you. I hope the marker works now. Um, I know it's end of the day, so I'll try to keep it um, short and sweet. Um, so you guys know more than anyone else what the Gutenberg printing press moment means. Um, about 16th century, Gutenberg printing press was invented. And what it did was it just unleashed all the information that was sitting in the heads of thinkers, physicists, scientists, mathematicians, uh, out into the real world. That was the moment the printing press actually was mass manufactured, unleashed on society. So now the Gen AI is going through a Gutenberg printing press moment. So we, artificial intelligence was there before. Everybody is like, you know, hey, what's the hype with all of this? You know, you look at when AI was invented, it was invented in 1950. The word AI was coined at the Dartmouth conference. Um, the first AI programming language, Lisp, was actually invented there. You know, I have actually used Lisp, even though I'm not that old. Um, and, um, you know, 1958, the concept of Perceptron, which was actually about taking feedback loops, right, you know, back in, so that, you know, a decision could be made based on the experience the system learned, was in 1958. And there was a huge AI boom in the 1960, you know, AI applications like ELISA, which was a psychotherapist for, um, you know, defense, uh, folks in the defense space, um, you know, and, and was actually unleashed and it had tremendous effect uh, in, um, in specific narrow vertical functions. And there was a huge winter in the 1980s because people were figuring out where else can I use this, right? The both evolution of the algorithms, the models and data was pretty low at that time and so there was a huge winter. And then came NLP and computer vision in the 90s, deep learning in the 2000. But what really happened in the decade of first decade of 2000 was the rise of big data. Because if you know, the most three most important things that are required for AI to succeed is data with high volume, high velocity, and high variety, without which you really cannot unleash AI at scale. And so that's what happened in the 2000. And then, you know, beyond 2010, was generative AI. So all of this sort of culminated in the exponential growth in Gen AI that we are seeing today. And what ChatGPT, DALI 3, and Google Gemini did to make this so pervasive, so useful, uh, and so novel was that they have made AI applications accessible to all. It's no longer sitting in the laboratory of Bengio or Jeffrey Hinton or any of these founding fathers of AI or in Google's lab. It's there with you and me. And with this, you know, Goldman Sachs is predicting that Gen AI could raise global GDP by almost $7 trillion in the next 10-year period, right? That's the impact that we are going to have in the coming decade. So it's never going to be really the same again. And just to even give you an example of some of the things going on, look at this. This is Meta's EMU, right? Short video clips generated by AI based on your behaviors, personal preferences, choices, likes, and so on and so forth, so that you can go and like it even more. And not only that, their Gen AI system is also, their ad system is now Gen AI based, so that it looks at, okay, did you like this video created by Gen AI? And so my ad system will create an ad for you, so you can go actually click it, and that leads to buying and commerce and so on and so forth. So entire companies, are moving towards possibilities of being run entirely by Gen AI, if not 100%, at least 50 to 60%. And this, of course, has led to exponential growth in Gen AI-based investments. Right? We see investments increase by about close to 500% in the last three to four years. And we all know about Microsoft's $10 billion um, investment with OpenAI and a lot more going forward. But all of this also comes at a cost. I mean, sure, the market size, we are looking at six to seven trillion GDP. You know, already there are 5,000 plus apps, 100 million plus chat GPT users, probably 150 million now. Um, but then all of this comes at a cost. I and mean, you just look at the number of parameters that went into GPT-1 probably like six years ago. 117 million parameters go, went into the AI model for GPT-1. And you fast forward to 2023 with GPT-4, which is basically ChatGPT, 
it has 1.8 trillion parameters inside the model that's responding to you when you say, hey, what dress did uh, Modi ji wear to, uh, you know, the Ram Janma uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, inauguration. And it will tell you, but then the model is going to have 1.8 trillion parameters and all this is going to come. Just by the next three to four years, the amount of increase in data center cost purely because of Gen AI is, is going to be 100 billion plus. Even in our own case, the cost of search, right, traditional search, we used to go in and say, you know, I want a black shirt or, you know, what did, uh, what happened with Israel and Palestine yesterday? But that's not how youngsters of today are doing search, right? They're going to come in and say, hey, give me the dress. Um, I want to buy the same dress that uh, Jennifer Lopez wore to this particular con concert, right? Um, and then traditional search, whether it's Flipkart or Amazon, is not geared up for it because you have to bring a lot of contextual information in. Right? You have to go into the internet, figure out what happened at that event, when did this movie star go to that event, what was this concert about, what did she actually wear, which brand was it, where is it available, and then come back and assemble a results page for you. Right? So, yes, Gen AI is going to be interesting, and Gen AI is the solution for a semantic search or a problem statement like that which will lead to higher conversions, but it's going to come at a cost, and the cost is 10x increase in cost per query. Somebody's going to have to pay for all of this. Now, that aside, there's, of course, fundamental challenges for the industry, and as the media industry, you're also very well aware of many of these. Privacy, of course. I mean, today, we I'll give you some examples later of how is Rakuten using Gen AI in our internal systems. For it to give phenomenal answers or give summarizations or create content, you've got to feed it great content as well. Now, if I am a multinational company or, you know, I am a corporate firm, what happens to my privacy laws? You know, in fact, in our own finance team, they're using ChatGPT to say, can you give me a summary of the PNL of the last quarter and the next quarter, right? Nobody's going to want to write charts and graphs and plot them anymore, but then you've got to input all financial data into that, right? And my corporate privacy laws tell me you cannot do that. You can't just upload Excel sheets to ChatGPT and say, give me a summary of this. Who is going to enforce all of that, right? Privacy, IPR. You know, you look at uh, just two weeks ago, um, OpenAI CTO was caught in an uncomfortable position when they said, can you tell us what all data you have trained your algorithms on? Right? Of course, they've used public data, public information. and buzz petabytes and uh, zettabytes of data that's out there. And so your model has now become smart because of his data and whose IP is this now? So a lot of difficult questions to answer. And of course, things like bias. I, we all saw this, that somebody asked who are the founding fathers of um, America and it showed seven African-American gentlemen as opposed to, you know, uh, predominantly white founders of America because the data was trained with a certain set of data and it gave it answers based on that. So it's not necessarily bias in terms of the algorithm becoming bias, it became bias because the data exposed to it was bias. And of course, safety related issues, you know, profanity, hacking, prompt injection, got to deal with all of that, right? I mean, this is not child's play. Anybody can come in and do a prompt injection and then enter the company's information network. So we've got to solve for all of this as an industry. Now I'll talk a little bit about AI at Rakuten so that it gives you a sense of what do we do. We are a pretty large Japanese conglomerate, over 70 plus companies, 27 year old. Um, you know, everything from e-commerce to fintech to payments, media, streaming, messaging. We own Rakuten Viber. Um, you know, we operate in 20 plus companies, sports, media and entertainment. Um, and pretty much around 8 to 10 percent of Japan's digital GDP flows through Rakuten. So that's how big we are globally. In India, we have the largest technology center of um, Rakuten globally. You know, we have a 4,000 plus technology team, half of whom are working on AI and Gen AI, working out of Bangalore. And we also have a technology business based out of India. Uh, we are not entered India in the commerce or B2C space. We are in India in a B2B space. Um, similar to AWS, we have a whole bunch of uh, applications, software, web scale software, 
AI software that we sell to as SaaS software to other companies. Um, from an AI perspective, there's many different areas that we look at, you know, in terms of applied AI, right? Customer. What do we mean by customer? Um, customer behavior across our platforms, about 70 different platforms, helps us scale our business faster and provide more amazing experiences to our users. You know, just understanding customers purchasing power on their commerce platform, um, you know, the amount of loans that they have taken on Rakuten Bank gives us a sense for their risk and their ability to pay, and it helps us better tailor different products when they come in and say, hey, here, I need a collateral to buy stocks and trades on Rakuten Securities, right? So we have about 6,000 different attributes for every single customer on our platform as we look at them continuously and their performance across all our 70 different businesses. We work on things like computer vision, face detection based payments. Somebody comes in, they walk into a 7-Eleven store in Japan, they use Rakuten payments, face recognition, you just go and put all your groceries in a basket, show your face and just walk out. And that's because your identity is linked to your Rakuten credit card on the back, back end, and so it just makes it seamless. We work in areas like curing cancer. In fact, in India we have the cancer research team that's working on immunotherapy to deal with cancer, right? Um, of course, chemo and you know, all these other different ways of cancer cure are already there. But uh, for head and neck cancer specifically, uh, we are using AI to be able to detect, not only detect, but excite the immune cells to go after the cancer cells. The reason cancer is incredibly hard is because your immune system, it's not that it's not there, it's just asleep. Right? It just doesn't know that this other thing is a foreign particle that's trying to take over your body. So you've got to retrain the killer cells of the body, which is the T cells, and train them that these are cancer cells, so go after it and start killing it. So a lot of amazing work is going on in AI in cure cancer space, and similarly language and voice. You know, these days, a lot of our merchants, for example, come in and they just dictate you know, their catalog. Right? We use Gen AI to build out their own catalog. Uh, search as I told you before, has become extremely complex. You know, there are kids from 18-year-old to 68-year-old searching on our e-commerce website, right? And the search algorithm cannot be, uh, you know, uh, based on one single customer type. And that's where we use Gen AI to understand meaning and context and semantics so that we can customize and personalize our responses to our customers. Um, as I told you before, we use Gen A in multiple different areas. Just one example is something called AI programmer. I mean, one of the, um, for some of you who are from the computer science and software background, our Rakuten securities business, which is stock purchase, sales, mutual funds, buy, sell, and so on. I mean, this is like the grow or zero that type of business of Rakuten. This is written over 15 years ago. And it's written in C++. It's written in C++ because that's the language that's, you know, about as fast as it gets, right? You know, in security space, you need milliseconds latency. That's also too late. You need microsecond latency because, you know, people are doing algorithmic trading at scale, right? A billion trades are happening every second. So you do see, we, that code is all written in C++ 10 years ago. You now, one of the challenges we have today is go try finding a C++ programmer in the university today. Nobody exists. Try to catch a 21-year-old or even a 28-year-old who knows C++. They don't. So then how do I maintain the software that's running a $2 billion business for me? Right? So we use Gen AI and say, okay, Mr. Fresh Grad who just graduated from IIT Delhi, you code in Java, I'm gonna use Gen AI to translate it to C++. We go and use that to continue to upgrade our software, right? So this is stuff that's actually happening. It's not, it's an existential problem for us. It's not some, you know, uh, novelty out there that we're trying to solve for. Uh, similarly, securities assistant, I'm giving an example, you know, um, for us to be able to scale, there are people who come at various different life stages. People come in and say, hey, I'm a 28-year-old or 28-year-old, I need to buy a home when I'm 35, you know, I need to plan for my kids' education, blah, 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 I need a portfolio. Again, we are using Gen AI there to do portfolio management for clients uh, because it's able to piece together a lot of information on life stage and, you know, economics and compensation and salary and risk and, um, you know, risk versus reward, age, and comes back and assists them through their portfolio management. So a lot of very, very interesting things going on in the generative AI space. 
Now, of course, as application scale, like I would say at, in our company, about 50 to 60% of our applications are using one or the other form of AI. And so then what happens? Application scale, if I have 75 businesses and each business runs around 1,000 applications, that's 75,000 applications that we are running at our scale. All of 50% of this uses AI, which means data, as I told you, we, we generate about 150 petabytes of data in a week, right? So you need to look at what your data pipeline looks like is, we are doing all of these business analytics based on the data that we are generated, but nobody knows how good is this data. How good, how secure are these algorithms? How secure is the data that's being generated? And finally, the Gen AI model itself can malfunction. You guys know about hallucinations. You guys know about Gen AI models can get hacked. And the model itself, you know, AI all said and done is not 100% accurate. Right? There's something called precision versus recall. If you shoot for 100% or 95% precision, the trade-off is something called recall, which is how broad of use cases can I solve for? If you solve for recall, which is how broad of use cases I solve for, precision goes down, which means I give you things at 80% accuracy. Now, if you're not aware of this, everything, all the assumptions you're making are going to go for a toss. So we have a product called Sixth Sense, which basically goes in um, and just observes generative AI itself 24 by 7. Right? It's looking for, is this particular Gen AI app protecting sensitive information? Is it following the policies of my company? Is it looking at toxicity and fairness in terms of the content being generated? Uh, and this performance of Gen AI itself, I mean, if you're an engineer, you're going to fire up those NVIDIA chip and, you know, that open AI uh, API on uh, Google Cloud, and you'll just let it open. Every hour, you're probably raking in a few hundred thousand dollars of bills. Who is looking at it from a corporate perspective and saying, man, you got to shut this down. Otherwise, I'll end up with a $10 million bill that my engineers ran up just because they're testing out LLMs. And finally, as I said, accuracy, relevance, hallucination, drift, all of these things need to be protected, which is why we have taken this product called Rakuten Six Sense Generative AI, and we are now marketing it, as I mentioned to you, as part of a B2B business. We are selling it to you know, all technology, large technology and non-tech customers who are deploying AI everywhere. So with that, I'll end with two points. One is, for us, AI is not just artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. Because you can't really remove the human in the loop. For the reasons I told you, it's not mature technology yet. It will eventually get there someday, but until then, you still need human in the loop. And so for us, it's augmenting human potential through AI. And finally, with all of this, at the end of the day, with, we are all going after large markets, we are going after higher income, higher profits, but it needs to be tempered with responsibility. I know some, some of you may have spoken about AGI. Sure, there will come a day where AGI or automatic um, you know, general intelligence will run the show. It can run a company, it can run a state, it can run a company, it can run a country. But we do have a responsibility to our society and to customers. So let's be empathetic and, you know, and be extremely responsible in the way we unleash Gen AI on society. So that's all I have. Hopefully I'm within time. Thank you again. It was hopefully you were able to relate to this. And uh, if you Delhiites happen to be in Bangalore someday, please come by, say hello. We are in Bangalore in Kaban Park, and I see a lot of great tech startups out here. Um, you know, we are happy to talk to you and see how we can enable each other. Thank you. Thank you, Anuragji, again for your warm invitation. Thanks.